that. There we go. Oh, I see it. So did uh, anybody out there have uh, some opportunity to uh, to notice any irritation come into their mind and during their lunch break and or some ill will thoughts and be able to check it and send out metta? That's just the question I'm asking out there. Yeah, I didn't notice anything, Bonte. The only thing I focused on was trying to see about creating a feeling in my core, that loving kindness feeling mm -hmm. uh, is what I was kind of focusing on during the break. Uh, I wasn't very successful with that, but I was trying to get that, an actual, you know, the feeling of that arising uh, was working on it. And we also have to be... Uh mindful and being able to detect the subtle impulses to aversion uh, that you know, crop up into our mind. Uh, like, you know, maybe in your house, uh, you, you know, somebody in your household or your dog or your cat did something that uh, mm -hmm. brought some uh, little, uh, irritation to your to your mind, like maybe your cat peed on your carpet or something, or I don't know, you know. So we can see these, uh, you know, even those little things, those uh, that quick arising of irritation, uh, you know, if left unchecked, that can, can grow. So that's, uh, you know, because metta is the antidote for, uh, you know, that, uh, this type of version and then if we notice any irritation then we reflect well you know that's an animal's nature they, they, they can't help it or even somebody in your household maybe you told your son or daughter not to play their stereo loud but they did anyway <laughs> so you know these are just uh, habits that uh, you know come quickly into our mind but uh, you know those are uh, and then have, uh, you know, have, uh, well, we'll talk about compassion now, later. Well, Bonte, it looks like most of the folks have joined us, I think, that were here before. Okay. So uh, do you want to go ahead and we'll, and Danica, um, do you want to share with us our, our uh, thoughts on Donna for this retreat? Oh, they're going to do that now? Okay. Yeah, is, if that's okay with you. Yes. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, I would like to say a few words about Dana. Dana, a Pali word for generosity is at the heart of Buddhist teachings as a very important part of our spiritual development. The essence is unconditional love, a boundless and openness of heart and mind, and a selfless giving that is free from attachment and expectations. It always moves something in both giver and receiver and um, always to the benefit of all. But in giving, it is important to keep in mind qualities of giving. Uh, giving in faith, being happy before, giving during and after. Giving with respect, um, giving with care, thoughtfulness, deference and mindfulness paying great attention and how we give. Giving at the right time, we need to discern when the right moment is, when the food, food is hard to get, giving to the sick, to travelers, to guests. Giving with a hospitable heart, giving, becomes, became, become, sorry. giving begins at home. It should be free from stinginess, devoted to charity, open-handed delighted to have a sharing giving. 
and at the end, giving without harming ourselves or others. Traditionally, dana is given at the end of the retreat, but also throughout the whole year to support and sustain monks, teachers that devote their lives to teaching. We all know that teachings are also given as dana with no cost attached. For the practical part for this retreat, emails we all received with Zoom link for the retreat, they also contain information how to send dana if you feel you would like to do it. If you encounter any problems or have any questions, uh, just reply to the email and let John know, we will sort it out. At the end, may thoughts of abundance, generosity, and connectedness stay with us all. Thank you. Thank you, Danica. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that information in the chat too. So there'll be a, I think we've got two or three different ways. Um, uh, Bonte, uh, I can put your mailing address for checks, correct? Uh, yes, but the, okay. uh, but the, any check should be made out to the Buddhist Vihara Society. Okay, and that information is on the website, right? So I can, I can pull it and put it on the chat. Uh, it, uh, hopefully, hopefully it is. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll make it happen. I'll put that up this afternoon. And then also... Even if it's a line of wisdom, I think it will also come there. But, uh, Good. But it's better to put the Buddhist Vihara Society. But on the on the memo line for uh, donation to LOW. Donation to LOW, line of wisdom. Yep. Thank you. And then I'll also put up the uh, PayPal link for our group. Anything that you put into there today, or if you note, if it's a day or two later, and you note that it's for, you know, Bonte, those dollars, everything we collect basically from this retreat is going to go to Bonte. So just how it gets there. Uh, if you want to go directly send Bonte a check, you can use our PayPal. Um, anything else, John, as far as how we can receive payments on our side that would work well for folks? Um, yeah, so we tested the payment link out and it should, if you have a card, that should work for a card. And uh, yeah, like Bob says, we'll follow up and compile it and make sure Bonte gets it. And uh, yeah, the the check option. There's a check option for us too, but it might make more sense to send it directly to Bonte uh, if, for the check option, but you can send it to us as well. And we'll, we'll make sure he gets it. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you all. Thank you. you know, we, we have a, a, a PayPal button on our uh, low website. So instead of going through two different PayPals, you could just uh, Instead of sending a check, you can go to the Lion of Wisdom website on the support page, and you will see a, a you know a donation PayPal donate by PayPal. Well, great! I can I can put that link up there as well. Maybe we'll just put uh, your PayPal and your uh, check directing information. Yeah, I'll put that up in the next half hour here while we continue. Anything else before we move on? Bonte resumes. Well, again, thanks everyone. Thanks, Bonte. I'll go off camera for a while and I'll make that happen in the chat for everyone so you can can use those links. I, I found that, I would just like to mention, I found the comment about uh, thinking of food uh, as a form of meta very helpful, you know, during the break and something I'll be thinking about, you know, something that is kindness to your body and and loving kindness. So um, I appreciated that that talk. Thank you. Okay, friends. So uh, now in this uh, afternoon session, I wanted to uh, continue to explore the other of the Brahma Viharas. Now, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are four of the Brahma Viharas. I think most of you have already you know, probably at least heard of them. Uh, and the, the second, third, and fourth one are the uh, compassion, you know, karuna, the Pali word, then mudita, or being a sympathetic joy, sometimes just called gladness, but I think sympathetic joy is a more uh, specific uh, type of uh, interpretation. Uh, 
or translation, and then equanimity. And these are uh, a path of graduated stages of also liberating the mind from the ego. Now, again, it's important to understand that the, uh, the heart of the Buddhist teaching is or the heart of suffering, the deepest level of suffering is being uh, under the delusion of the ego and being caught in the web of I, me, and mine. And that, uh, you know, most of all of the actions that we, actions and thoughts that we, we do in our life are oriented around I, me, and mine and the pr preservation of that. But this, this thought of I, me, or mine is something really we weren't born with. Like the young baby, when it's born, it doesn't have any thoughts of I, me, or mine in it. But these are acquired once it gets, uh, you know, the parents give it a name. And then as it starts to develop its senses, it forms its likes and dislikes. Basically, the liking of pleasurable feeling and the dislike of painful feeling. And so that almost everything that we do as the person grows up, everything they've ever experienced in life, whether it's something they see, hear, taste, smell, touch, or think about, uh, the mind is divided in, into these things I like and these other things I don't like. Or there's many kind of just neutral ones where there's no reaction, but the ones that we create most of our karma around are the, the things that we like or don't like. And it's all oriented around the thought of I, me, or mine. I, me, or mine is in the Buddhist meditation uh, uh, language, uh, you know, sort of the trinity, the trinity of suffering, I, me, and mine. So uh, <clears throat> the, the Brahma Vihara is our way to help to also weaken uh, that, uh, that self centeredness that brings. Uh, you know, most of our defilements. So, uh, you know, metta, we've already discussed uh, the metta. And the metta is the easiest of the Brahma Viharas to practice because primarily it starts with thoughts, you know, you know, thoughts, of course, directed to oneself, but it shouldn't stop there, you know, even though this morning we were folks being primarily on that, but that's only a starting point, as I mentioned. Uh, and then you have to gradually expand that. Uh, the idea of loving all uh, living beings, that's, uh, that's something that's not in the mind of the you know, ordinary uh, people. Uh, so, you know, gradually, and also, it's connected to the life force. That means the same life force that causes your heart to beat, causes your uh, lungs to expand and contract and activates all the cells in your body is the same life force in every single living being, a human, animal, or otherwise. And so it's that really that we try to uh, connect with. It's that feeling of that life force uh, within you, within the core of somebody was uh, mentioning uh, uh, before we got started here, that, that feeling of being connected to uh, life itself. So actually when you, when you get grounded and centered in the body and you feel that those life force vibrations in your body, especially if you've been you know, you're familiar with the body scanning technique or just with the mindfulness of breathing in the body, you get in touch with those uh, underlying uh, life force vibrations. And that is life itself, really. You know, uh, we call life our, you know, living in a house, having a family, doing jobs, enjoying things, going here and there. But <laughs> the real life and real living is actually the, the cells and molecules uh, that make up your body and mind and the electromagnetic energy that is going through your, your nervous system 
and so on is, is the real life force. Of course, the average person has no idea really what that is or uh, maybe as an intellectual idea, but not actually feeling it. So through the meditation practice, we learn how to get back in touch with that as a living reality. And uh, that's why we recommend people to first trying to gain that type of uh, re getting re-centered and grounded in the body as a starting point. Then, then the practice of metta and so on uh, goes quite easily. But anyway, so metta starts with the intellectual kind of sending out these thoughts, but then also one needs to exhibit that in their uh, interactions with people in terms, you know, being friendly towards uh, people uh, in, uh, you know, word and, and deed and actions and, you know, in body language and so on, and just developing uh, that sense of uh, friendliness. And so that's the easiest to practice. Metta is the easiest one to, to practice. Now, karuna or compassion is the second one. Now, the reason metta comes first is because if you're not friendly, you won't have compassion. So first one has to be friendly to oneself in order to have compassion for yourself. Or you have to be friendly to other people in order to actively uh, cultivate uh, deeds of uh, compassion and so on. So that is why the metta is really the, the starting point. And it's sort of the easiest to practice, you know, just being friendly to people. Now, compassion takes a little bit more work because compassion needs more uh, active effort. So compassion is the active manifestation of the friendliness. So if you see somebody in need, somebody suffering, you know, you try to actively help them, not just saying, oh, I have compassion for you, but then uh, let the old lady struggle across the street and stumble and fall down, and, you know, instead of actually going and help her. So the, the compassion is more active, and so it takes more of your time. And so therefore it gets closer to the ego, it gets closer to the, the self. So basically the, the compassion is the feeling, the suffering of others, but then uh, generating the effort to try to relieve it if possible. And so, uh, you know, there's many instances of, of that in our daily uh, life. Uh, you know, people, there's so many people are asking for, for help these days. And of course, you know, donate, practicing dana is, is a part of that kind of compassion. So you, you donate to charities, for example, or, you know, there's all these people uh, who are um, creating these GoFundMe sites for various uh, catastrophes that have happened. Uh, or problems in their lives. So there's so many, we, we see so many compassionate people, uh, they donate and people have accumulated money. So anyway, that's just one example. But so <clears throat> compassion is uh, the active trying to uh, uh, help people that are in need. Uh, or even, even with, uh, you know, not only people, but uh, animals. So if you see a, uh, a typical example is if you see an insect that's suffering, you know, like in the in your sink at home is a, a you know a centipede or a cockroach, you know, stuck in your sink and trying to get out instead of turning the water on and flushing it down the sink, you know, to, to put it on a piece of paper and you know maybe put it outside. So anyway, these are just small acts of compassion that we can cultivate, and so we direct this compassion to ourself also uh, starting and we have compassion for our, our weaknesses right so we all have you know some type of uh, 
weaknesses or you know our habits that uh, we find difficult to uh, overcome and then some people you know beat themselves or uh, you know because for it that they don't have the strength and the energy to overcome some of these type of unhealthy habits and it's true that you know habits are not easy to overcome so in one way we have to have compassion knowing that these habits have been accumulated over a long period of, of time or some inherited uh, traits that you might have uh, gotten so let's say even genetic traits and so on uh, but you don't let the compassion necessarily compassion uh, has two aspects or you know one can be a, a kind of a just a, a mushy type of compassion that means just doing anything for anybody who asks you any time or and bending over backwards uh, even to the the point of causing yourself suffering uh, you try to help people in different ways and some people don't want your help uh, or we think we have to go out and save uh, the world and that's also not realistic so we have to know sort of our own limits also and do what we can in our immediate surroundings helping others who in our family or other friends or generally it, you know when you hear something has happened if it's within your means and ability then we try to help them uh, and again the the like uh, donating one's time in the practice of dana is not only uh let's say offering money or supporting uh, charities and so on in that way but like uh, offering one's time to help other people uh, and I often use this example let's say there is somebody who needs your help maybe they, uh, you know, they have to get something done some fixing their house or something done within a few days and then uh, they, they got sick and they couldn't do it and, and so they ask you know you could, could you come over on uh, Saturday or Sunday and uh, help me uh, <clears throat> do this project or, uh, you know, take care of my uh, sick dog or cat uh, uh, for me. Uh, and then you think, oh, there's this football game, a basketball game on Saturday and Sunday, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get my nephew, you know, I'll pay him 10 bucks and I'll have him go over and help you. Okay, so that's the easy way out, right? Uh, instead of doing it yourself. So that's just one example about how uh, the, the act of compassion, you know, gets deeper to one's own uh, sense of uh, self to, to uh, you know, to practice that, uh, you know, helping others and so on. So whenever we can, uh, you know, volunteer or donate our time. These are all things that, you know, we always say, well, what could I do myself with that time or with that money that I've donated? Uh, uh, and so the ego is always trying to position itself in one way or another. And that's what we uh, have to be mindful of. And where this, these uh, Brahma Viharas uh, uh, play their important uh, part in the in the active daily life and so the, the compassion is an antidote actually for cruelty so the metta is an antidote for ill will and compassion is an antidote for for cruelty uh, wanting to you know not wanting to cause suffering to others so you can see there's a progression. They, they, they seem a little bit similar, but uh, they're uh, different also. The, the ill will is one thing, but the cruelty is a more active uh, thing. 
you can be cruel also in your speech uh, by hurting people through one's speech and one's actions. And that's why, you know, of course, the practice of the precepts, for anybody who's familiar with, you know, the Dhamma teachings and the, the practice of sila, like the five precepts itself is a, is a practice of uh, compassion. So by taking the precept to avoid from killing, you are practicing compassion. To take the precept to avoid from stealing, you're also practicing compassion by not uh, hurting others through taking their possessions. In practicing not telling lies, you're also practicing compassion. And so, and not intoxicating the mind, you're also practicing compassion. That means compassion to your own mind and to yourself, because when you get intoxicated, uh, then that's when people wind up losing their self-control and uh, causing harm to themselves and others. So we can see that even abiding trying to live one's life by the five precepts is an active practice of uh, compassion also. Uh, to oneself, to avoid the pain that would come to you as a result of breaking the precepts and to minimize the pain and suffering caused to others by your breaking uh, the precept. <clears throat> so we have the uh, the metta, which then naturally should lead to the uh, practice of compassion. And then the next of the Brahma Viharas is uh, oftentimes it's uh, translated as gladness, but sympathetic joy is a uh, translation that I prefer to, to use because it's, uh, it's uh, more specific. And uh, basically, and sympathetic joy is harder to practice than compassion. Because if, if you're not friendly to others and you don't have compassion to others, there's no way you're going to be glad when your enemies, something, some good fortune comes to people you don't like. And so basically this mudita is, uh, the joy upon hearing the good fortune that happens to others. You would be happy about that, just as you would be happy when some good fortune comes to you. Let's say you get some inheritance or you, you, uh, you know, win a lottery. <laughs> that doesn't always bring joy, but uh, uh, so many other types of things, or job promotion, that's, that's a good one. Uh, or, you know, a person overcomes their illness. So to be happy at the, the good fortune when good things happen to us. Now, this especially relates to the people that you may not care for, or if it's to your own expense. Let's say people, uh, you know, have been buying a lottery ticket uh, for, you know, so many months or years at a certain shop, you know, and then they realize that some guy who, some person who uh, only bought one ticket at a certain 7-Eleven or something uh, won the lottery. Now, most people probably with the initial thought would be, ah, you know, I, I should have gotten that or, you know, wouldn't be so happy, or at least they would think that, you know, they deserved at least to, to win one time. So, you know, we don't know the karma of, of, of other people. But anyway, to, so to have, uh, uh, be happy that that person uh, won the lottery, it makes them happy. Of course, there's lots of pros and cons. We can comment about the, that. <laughs> For some reason, winning the lottery can be the beginning of hell, but uh, <clears throat> we've read stories about that. But more importantly, let's say with job, jobs, right? So you have a job and maybe somebody else in your company is, they're, they're trying to get the same promotion. And you, you all do the right things and maybe the other, the other person uh, 
if you think that they're cheating some way or in other words anyway the other person gets the promotion and usually you know the ordinary person would say i deserve to get that you know and, or they, they did this and that so it it gets even closer to your ego to have happiness or joy at the at your own expense when somebody else uh gets that uh, the kind of promotion at your own expense or in some other uh, way, you know, when, or something good happens to somebody, we say, oh, they shouldn't have gotten that, you know, they shouldn't have done that. And, and that's all, basically, it's our, our ego uh, talking. So is having the cultivating mudita or happiness at the good fortune of others uh, is also a, a check on uh, jealousy. So it helps to minimize that kind of hindrance of jealousy or envy at things that other people have. And it's also based on people get the, uh, their karmic results. In other words, that most of the things that happen to us have their seeds or root in some type of previous karmic connection. Now, a lot of people don't like to hear that and they say, oh, that's not true or this and that, but uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about in terms of the deep unconscious mind. But anyway, so, uh, you know, if some good fortune happens to somebody, that's said to, uh, you know, be the result of some good karma they did, maybe just uh, the work that they put into uh, getting something, uh, or it could be some other uh, kind of seed that was planted a long ago. So, therefore, you know, there's, there's more that meets the eye when it comes to uh, karma, when we look around and we see how evil people are seem to be getting away with murder or getting away with doing all kind of things. Again, on the surface, we may see it that way, but we may not know uh, deep down inside there could be some other reasons why, even though a person may seem to be a, you know, a corrupt or a bad person and they seem to be getting away with it, at some point uh, they'll you know, have to uh, meet the, or get the results of their, their action. But anyway, so the mudita, sympathetic joy, that's a practice that we can uh, also uh, practice in our daily life whenever we uh, see things going on uh, to, to understand how our mind is trying to make some excuses for that or wishing that or ill toward others, thinking others don't deserve uh, what they they might be getting. So that's why the sympathetic joy, because it, it's it, because of your own expense, you have to be, uh, you know, have the joy about that. To, again, it's all about weakening uh, the, the sense of I, me, and mine. And then the practice of equanimity uh, comes last. So you can see that all three of these uh, uh, Brahma Viharas are helping to weaken uh, the sense of I, me, and mine, which is the deepest underlying root of uh, the suffering. And equanimity actually is an end result. So a lot of people talk about practicing equanimity. Actually, we don't really practice equanimity. We practice mindfulness. The ordinary person, when they say they practice equanimity, they're practicing mindfulness and restraining themselves. Uh, but equanimity actually is one of the, the highest or deepest levels of mental uh, purity. And equanimity means the even-mindedness. It's not... Uh, bending towards pleasure or not pulling away from pain. And it's not uh, 
you know, discriminating between sort of uh, the opposites. And whatever the situation arises in the present moment, the mind can accept that without causing any uh, negative uh, reactions or causing any mental uh, disturbance. So to have equanimity, to being able to uh, tolerate, you know, unpleasant uh, sounds, body sensations, even thoughts. And equanimity is also based on the wisdom that ultimately everything is empty of any absolute uh, sort of identity or absolute uh, uh, individual independent uh, existence. So that everything basically is conditioned. And uh, any of you who have uh, you know, studied about the, the jhanas, we know that equanimity is that mental factor that arises only in the third or the fourth uh, jhana. Uh, and the fourth jhana is where the equanimity becomes the most purified. So uh, you can see that equanimity really is the result of the mental uh, training. So, but we can practice equanimity, equanimity in a kind of a way, but actually what we're really practicing is mindfulness and restraining. So when your meditation practice, when your pain arises, uh, some irritation or pain arises in the body, you try to uh, relax around you. Even though it's painful, you, you try to relax, you, you try to uh, tolerate it, you try to build up that uh, tolerance to it. But still, underneath, you wish you'd be free from that. Uh, so basically, you know, we're practicing that, uh, you know, mindfulness and restraint. But the real equanimity comes as a result of having uh, done the work of overcoming the hindrances and have developed the mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom to the extent of being able to reach the third or fourth jhanas or the equanimity in the, in the vipassana meditation uh, system. So <clears throat> the, the equanimity is also is an antidote for both sense desire and aversion. So it means like, you know, not being attached to your choices and being content with whatever happens to be uh, offered and arise without, uh, you know, strong, you know, attachments or aversions arising. So again, that can, uh, and, and that happens not by pre-planning it, but even on the spot when something happens uh, to be able to have that uh, equanimity arising. So it's really the, the result of having practiced the metta, the karuna, and the mudita. By the time you've been able to cultivate those positive uh, emotions, then in the end, and again, those, those positive emotions help to overcome the, the hindrances. So it helps to overcome all of the hindrances, basically the sense desire, the ill will, the restlessness and worry, the, the doubts and the uh, mental lethargy. So in, in, in addition to our regular meditation uh, practice, we are overcoming uh, those, those hindrances. And uh, that's what also allows us to uh, then gain those states of, of concentration. So the, but the active practices that we're doing are, you know, trying to practice where and when those opportunities arise in our daily life, we can uh, practice them 
uh, at that time. And so the, uh, by cultivating metta each day, then hopefully we'll, when, when, when an opportunity to practice compassion arises to help uh, somebody else in need, uh, we can do that without uh, you know, thinking, well, you know, you know, should I really help that person? Maybe they don't really need help or uh, you know, what can I do with my uh, time or uh, donation or so on uh, you know, for myself and so on. So to help kind of weaken those attachments, we can uh, practice uh, that. And whenever we hear about something good happening to others, instead of uh, cultivating some negative thoughts, to be uh, too happy about that, uh, or at least to be, you know, not to have the, the negative uh, feelings uh, toward these uh, people. Now, another way to practice these things in the daily life are uh, that we can practice uh, usually what I uh, uh, you know explain to people at the end of retreats and so on and practicing the meditation in the daily life. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they may meditate once or twice a day for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or one hour. And uh, that's uh, all and good. <clears throat> but then usually there's a longer time between the meditation periods when they don't specifically, uh, you know, are sort of meditating. And they often, uh, you know, lose track of the, the fact that, you know, meditating on the cushion or cultivating these thoughts of meditation, you know, we have to carry that meditation in whatever uh, the vibrations, uh, mental vibrations carry, you know, pay that forward or, uh, you know, carry it into our uh, other activities. So, I wanted to mention something about the uh, the practicing of the the M and M's. Uh, some of you may have heard about these M and M's. Uh, an M and M stands for a minute meditation, and this is a specific practice that we train ourselves uh, during the day to stop once an hour and to stop whatever we were doing sort of freeze in our tracks and uh, bring our, let go of whatever we might have been thinking about or doing and bring our mind to uh, the body, bring our mind to the present moment and take a couple of deep, slow breaths. And that helps us to, you know, regain our mindfulness and to get back in touch with the present moment and to get back in touch with the body to feel whatever you were doing in that last hour to be able to you know sort of cut that off let go of that that rush to the future and also in that m and m you can release or let go of any negativity that you might have accumulated in that previous hour so it's a specific, uh, specific training we try to do uh, every hour to, to stop and whatever any negativity or just the rushing around, uh, being unmindful to, to uh, pause and to get reconnected and to let go of any of those negative thoughts. And if somebody had uh, hurt you in that last hour, or did something that you're holding on to, you can practice uh, forgiveness. Now, actually, forgiveness is an inter integral part of also practicing the, the metta and the karuna, or the friendliness and the compassion. Uh, so uh, usually it's because 
people wouldn't do things to us and we feel that they're at fault and, you know, we're holding these grudges against people. This would also would prevent us from being able to show loving kindness and, and compassion for others. And so to practice forgiveness, whether you do it at night, actually, uh, before in your last evening meditation is a good time to do it. But even during the daytime, uh, if somebody did something to you that you're holding on to in the last hour, practice forgiveness there and then, and then send metta. So forgiveness should be practiced first to forgive anybody that you feel may have done something um, against you or to hurt you in some way or another. And also to forgive oneself if you did something unmindful uh, during the day to forgive one's self also. Knowing that really basically until one is enlightened, we're all like little children learning to walk, right? We, we take a few steps and stumble and fall down. We have to get back up. We have to take a few more steps and stumble and fall back down until we, we gain the strength of our uh, mindfulness and our dharma uh, practice. So we uh, uh, learn to forgive others who've done things and forgive ourselves. And but it de determine that uh, let me not make the same mistakes uh, in the future. Let's say you you said somebody innocently, you know, you 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 said some remark, but a person might have taken it the wrong way and gotten hurt or offended uh, by that. And uh, even if you think that it wasn't your fault, still to you know ask them for your forgiveness or forgive. Uh, uh, you know, yourself for doing that and then determine, try to be more mindful in the future. And then to send the, the metta. So it's difficult to send metta or compassion if you're still holding some resentment and grudges toward others. So that forgiveness is an integral part of sort of the practice. So in <clears throat> every hour during the day, when one does an M and M, if there's some uh, incident that happened, you can include that uh, practice of uh, forgiveness in that uh, M and M, or just rest in the present moment and uh, just let the mind come back and touch base with the present <coughs> moment to uh, to sort of to break that uh, neurotic push to the future. Most people live their lives and their mind is always, because their lives are busy and people are doing lots of things, they're, <clears throat> they're going from one activity to the other without really pausing or slowing down much. And that's when we, we make mistakes. And so the, the practice of the m, &M is that, you know, and, you know the m, m candies, right? They're small and sweet. So these minute meditations are also uh, short but sweet. I mean, you, you stop that push to the future. You take a deep breath, deep, slow breath, bring your mind to the present moment, try to feel those life force vibrations in the body. And, and all of your dharma understanding will become uh, crystallized again there in those few moments. And then, of course, then you can practice, as I mentioned, uh, if need to be, you know, forgiving others, forgiving oneself, and then send out that uh, metta. And wishing my, that person be well and happy, free from uh, suffering. May they be well, happy, and peaceful, free from greed, hatred, and delusion. And to, <clears throat> to do that, you can train yourself to do that every hour throughout the day. That will be a great uh, supplement, a meditation supplement. So people take vitamin supplements, don't they? To supplement their iron or their protein or calcium or vitamin E or whatever. Uh, so these M&Ms are like a 
uh, supplement for our other daily meditation practice. So these, uh, anyway, so as part of these Brahma Viharas, uh, we, we should try to see how, you know, one goes into the next. And really, uh, you don't necessarily have to perfect one to go on to the next one. Now, in the Buddhist text, the Buddha mentioned there are 11 benefits from practicing metta. But these benefits only accrue if you've attained uh, the jhana, one of the uh, jhanas, first, second, third, or fourth jhana in one of these practices, or the, the first three jhanas with metta, karuna, and mudita. Most people probably won't reach that uh, level. But the benefits of uh, you know practicing metta, as I said, that a person will sleep in comfort, and they'll awake in comfort, and they won't have bad dreams, and they'll be dear to other human beings. They'll be a, uh, other people will be attracted to you because of that vibration of. Of, of the mind, and even non-humans would uh, be attracted to you. And devas or deities would guard that person. And fire, poison, and weapons would not harm that person. And one would easily gain concentration, and the face and countenance would be uh, serene. Anyway, these are the the 11 benefits of metta meditation that we read about in the suttas, but that's only if one is able to uh, attain the jhanic level of concentration in these uh, practices of the Brahma Viharas. So in the, in the practice of the metta again, you know, it may start out as, you know, repeating these phrases of, May I be well and happy, free from anxiety and fear and so on. Uh, and then wishing that towards others. But eventually those, those words, repeating the words, you know, comes down into sort of the, the heart center where it's, it's kind of just that, that uh, friendliness. Again, when you when you get, especially when you get in touch with the life force vibrations in your body, that's one of the easiest and most powerful and best ways of cultivating this inner uh, connection to the metta. Because metta is a natural vibration that's, uh, whenever it's free from the ego and the self, the metta becomes uh, unbounded because it's it's the ego that prevents that metta from going out in all directions so when you're able to tune in by practicing mindfulness of the body and also by learning how to you know be, become more grounded and centered in the breathing body you directly begin to experience this this present moment vibration, what you call the vibration of present moment awareness, which is always kind of just beneath the surface of our active mind. And that's why, you know, first of all, by developing this uh, mindfulness of, of the breathing and the body is really the entry point for being able to more effectively develop uh, the metta and the, and the karuna because it has that connection. Uh, you're, you're getting, uh, you know, connected to the life force itself, which is the same life force that's in, in all other uh, beings. So, uh, this, uh, you know, the practice of metta, as I mentioned, it's, it's uh, 
it's cultivated in the text when we read the Buddhist suttas, when the Buddha is talking about cultivating uh, metta, karuna, mudita, upekka. He talks about pervading the, the 10 directions, or he says one pervades the one quarter of the world with, with the metta, which is unbounded, free from ill will and enmity. And he pervades the second quarter. And he pervades, or she pervades the third quarter or the fourth quarter. What, whatever that, what that means is that you're gradually extending that, as I was suggesting in the earlier meditation, extending that uh, outward to the 10 directions of space. So this, this uh, unbounded vibrations, these, these, these vibrations of the cellular vibrations coming out of, off the body and the mind uh, are like you know, radio waves going outward. Um, and you know, people can, can feel that. And we, we know that you know, even animals can feel that too. Uh, so that comes by also learning how to get grounded and when you get re-centered and have developed that more continuous connection with that deeper level of present moment awareness, that's when it's easy to uh, permeate the, you know, all beings in all the different directions uh, with this, uh, just this, this vibration of the, you know, it's, it's not the words that you're sending out, but it's that vibration of the, the subtle vibration of life force that's, uh, you know, within every cell of the body, because every cell of our body has awareness and life force in it. But normally we hardly ever feel that. Uh, but you can easily get reconnected to that through the practice, especially of body centered awareness and developing mindfulness of, of breathing. And because it's always there underneath just underneath your nose, literally, or underneath the skin, is this parallel dimension of awareness or the present moment. And when the mind is able to rest in the present moment more and more, then the ideas of the past and the future, uh, you know, sort of dissolve, at, at, at least within that uh, period of time. And all ill will and cruelty and all the other negative emotions are connected with the past and the future. So when the mind has let go of the past and the future and is reconnected to the natural life force vibrations, then uh, that's when you uh, directly feel this connection to, you know, to sort of the to everything. Now, <clears throat> so now I would like to uh, actually, having said that much, I'd like to open it up now to see if anybody has any uh, questions about any of that that I have been uh, talking about uh, so far in the so we wanted people to write them down on on the chat. Let me uh, let's look in here. I don't know. I'll, this is just some other type of notices. Yeah, uh, we have a question here, Bonte. Yes. Okay, I see. There's some yeah. questions here. We're after the schedule, right? So. Yes, I believe. Uh, this question is, uh, generally, do we get entangled with same people whom we have met in the past lives, or more so we run into good and bad circumstances for lessons 
need to be learned not from the same individual. Uh, yes, both of those are probably, uh, you know, true or, you know, have some bearing. And uh, that we carry these memories of our encounters with other people with us. It's not really with us, but it's in the mental continuum. Uh, these uh, memories, and uh, they, it follows us around. And there's many instances within the, the 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 Buddha's life stories where they encountered each other, people uh, over and over again in the in their successive lives. So especially people who uh, love each other. If they really have that love for each other, when they die, they may become reconnected to those people in a future life. But the same is true for enemies. And if you have any uh, people that you have not forgiven in the life, or you have a strong memories, let's say, you know, people, uh, uh, well, for one example, don't get me wrong, or, you know, uh, I'm just saying some sort of like religious conflicts between certain religions that have been going on for hundreds and thousands of years, you know, uh, this and, uh, and so on. Uh, this is because people have fostered these, uh, uh, these things from the past and they, they keep on recycling. And so there might be people in your life you met, you know, you have an example of you meet somebody and immediately there's some some negative vibration, or you don't you don't get along with certain people for some reason. You don't really know why, but uh, you know. And then some other people you do. So you have to. Uh, each life is actually like a learning uh, uh, a classroom to learn lessons, to learn the lessons of life, to learn lessons of how to live in harmony with. Uh, the world, how to live in harmony with ourself and live in harmony with others uh, to avoid uh, the suffering and to uh, liberate the ego from its self-created uh, prison. So each life is like a, a classroom. And so you are dealt certain circumstances that are going to cause you to have to deal with these emotions uh, and to learn the lesson from them. So we, we may not uh, you know, meet the same, of course, we, we're not, we're not going to know that anyway. Most people have no memory of their past lives, so they don't know who they knew or not in their past lives. But, uh, you know, we've heard many stories of, of children, especially who remembered, uh, you know, being born in some place, who remembered some people. But anyway, uh, so even if you know we hadn't uh, specifically encountered a, you know, a person in a past life, other uh, lessons will arise that we have to overcome or to learn from. And those lessons are the lessons of uh, the Brahma Viharas, the lessons of non-greed, non-hatred, of generosity, of kindness, and of selflessness, and eventually of overcoming uh, the ego. And so, so many of the situations that we find ourselves in are uh, confront us with that. And even the fear of death. You know, fear is one of the, the biggest uh, pains and sufferings that people have in the fear of death. And until one has overcome the fear of death, then you're going to keep coming back around to uh, be born again and again until you, uh, you overcome that fear. Because the ego is at the heart of the fear of death even, or the fear of getting injured. Uh, so uh, even uh, all those situations, every 
situation we encounter in life should be seen as a challenge to ask ourselves, what is this uh, teaching me? You know, uh, you know, why don't I like this person? Or why is this, you know, we're always trying to decide, you know, why are these happening to me? We might not always know why, but nothing happens really without a, a reason. And uh, we have to learn how to accept that and take it as a, as a challenge and to, to deal with it. You know, like even so many people, you know, maybe people their whole life, they've been kind and considerate and they haven't done a lot of, you know, bad things to others, yet they encounter all, all kinds of painful situations in their life. And then these other people who tend to, as I already mentioned, doing a lot of things we normally wouldn't consider as being uh, cool or good, you know, cheating others and, and uh, telling lies and so on. And they seem to be, uh, you know, getting <laughs> rewarded for that in some way or another. So again, the law of karma is very mysterious and we can't figure all these things out. But the fact that everything that does happen to us, we have to see as a challenge and not as a curse. So we all know instances of people who have terrible tragedies that happen to them in their life. And it helped them to grow into a, you know, a stronger and better person because of, of that. Um, so anyway, that's how we have to, you know, we have to understand that the, you know, the law of karma is something that's very real, although a lot of people may not believe it, but uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't uh, exist and uh, it doesn't operate. So we have to, you know, again, learn how to live in harmony with the, the law of cause and effect, not to live out of disharmony out uh, with the law of cause and effect. And most people are living out of harmony with the laws of nature. So the karma is a law of nature, similar to gravity. If you throw something up, it comes back down. Uh, and so with the law of karma, if we throw something out of our mouth or our speech or our body, that action will uh, come back to us in one way or another. And that's a law of, of nature. It's not something the Buddha made up or uh, somebody else, but it's a law of nature. Uh, and living within the harmony of you know, the oneness. So, um, let's see, is there another question? If metta is boundless, is it impermanent? It is our true nature. Uh, well, metta is boundless in the sense of, you know, it's that, that energy that's beyond the ego, that's the, the life force, which is the awareness. Awareness is the life force, life force is awareness. And there's a difference between consciousness and awareness. Consciousness has the ego behind it. I am conscious. This dualistic perception of me here and the world outside. And so there's always this conflict between the self and the ego. So we have these six sense consciousnesses. And until we're fully enlightened, we have this sense of I there. And that's what limit, limits us to a great extent. So only when one has reached that level of the, the fourth jhana or the, uh, the stages of insight of the equanimity, uh, then that's only when the, the metta becomes uh, boundless. Uh, and is it our true nature? It's, it's a true nature in the sense of the metta is just simply that embrace 
of everything. Uh, and that's what awareness is. Awareness powers everything in the universe from a, a small dung beetle or a, a mosquito to you know human beings and, and everything else. It doesn't discriminate. It gives that life force to all the uh, you know types of all of of life. And so in that sense, uh, the life force is boundless. But when the life force is boundless, then metta is a natural uh, a manifestation of that because there's nothing discriminating between uh, the differences and so on. But you know, when we practice metta, that is a, an impermanent thing because it's just an emotion that we're cultivating until we finally reach that highest level of transcending the ego and with enlightenment, that's only when the, that metta is totally purified. That's why somebody like the Buddha had, you know, was the perfect personification of that uh, loving uh, kindness and metta, karuna, all those Brahma Viharas. Okay, so that looks like there's only those uh, two questions. So now we're going to... Uh... Oh, Bhante? Yes? I think there's a couple more a little further down, underneath the uh, donation info. Uh, one from Judith there. Let's start. Well, I might uh, save these questions for uh, after our meditation uh, practice, according to the schedule where we do some meditation now and have the questions uh, and answers uh, after that, okay? Thank you, Bhante. So uh, let's take a, a few minutes break if you need to use the uh, restroom or to take a drink of water or something or just, just to stretch your legs because it's not helpful to you know sit down and or to practice metta if your legs are already you know peening or you know if you're sitting in the cross-legged <laughs> position on the floor or, or something like that so uh, it's good to be you know fairly comfortable when you start the, uh, the practice so we'll take a few minutes uh, break and then come back for meditation practice.
Dear friends, we'll just try to uh, sit uh, in a straight posture. Even in the sitting meditation, it's important to try to keep your spine and head in a straight line, because that will help to keep the, the nervous system energy, the life force circulating in the most optimal way to help prevent uh, tina and midda, to help avoid you know, getting unnecessarily tired or the mind getting drowsy, and also to help to feel those life force vibrations in the body, as I mentioned. So we're going to start the first part of the meditation, trying to again get the, the mind centered in the body, the breathing body. First of all, just just gently close your eyes. Try to feel the natural inward curve of the lower spine it's supporting the upper body weight. Now just bring your attention down to feel where your buttocks press the seat. Just feel that weight of the body pressing the buttocks on the seat. Try to feel your right and left buttock. Now move the attention to feel your feet where your feet are crossed underneath and where they press the floor. Try to feel your toes. Try to feel the tingling sensation, the subtle pulsation in your feet, your toes. And just feel where the clothing touches the skin of the legs or feet. Even the sensations of the clothing touching the skin are also life force sensations. Now feel your hands and fingers touching where they touch together, or where they touch your legs. Try to feel the outline of your thumbs or fingers. Feel the subtle pulse of blood in your fingers. Now feel the weight of the arms hanging from the sides, from the shoulders. Feel where the clothing rubs against the skin of the shoulders or arms or upper chest. The ability to notice those areas of sensations is awareness. Awareness is life force. And now feel your head balanced on top of the neck.
to keep the chin lifted up level or parallel to the floor. And just rest your attention behind the eyes. Just feel the eyes in the sucker. Feel the eyelids stretched over the eye bone. And feel the subtle eye movement. Relax the eyes. might see some color or mental image or light there behind the eyes or in the eyes. From that point behind the eyes, you feel the other sensations in your head and face. You feel the sensations of the skin stretched over the front of the skull. You feel the nose. Feel the lips touching together where the upper lip touches the lower lip. Feel the sensation of dryness or moistness in the lip. Feel the tongue laying in the mouth. All these different sensations, life force vibrations, vibrations of cells, molecules, atoms, Electron, it's the real life. Life force that keeps everything alive. It doesn't belong to an eye, knee, or mind, but universal life force. Now let the awareness kind of expand to feel the outline of the whole body. Kind of be aware of the head on top, the shoulders, the hands, the buttocks and feet beneath. Just be aware of sitting, sitting. The sitting body. Try to hold that outline of the sitting body in the mind's eye. 
and begin some deep, slow breathing again. And take a few seconds just to expand your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest, holding the air in the lungs. A few seconds to allow all the oxygen to get out into the bloodstream. To recharge the cells of the body. And feel the relaxing contraptions of the out breath. At the end of the out breath, feel the body grounded on the floor. Just take several more deep, slow breaths like that, cultivating this basic mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Again, we're going to count the breaths from one to ten, try to develop a deeper concentration, try to continue deeper breathing if you can. With the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Holding the breath for one or two seconds. With the contracting out breath, also count to one. Do the last bit of air go out of the lung. And the next in breath, two. Out breath, two. In breath three, out breath three, in breath four. Out breath four. In five. Out five. In six, out six,
is um, out seven. In eight, out eight, in nine, out. Nine in ten out ten. Now just continue the counting. Just let the breathing return to its uncontrolled, shorter, irregular rhythm. Continue to feel it. Keep the attention focused on the subtle movements. Expanding and contracting. The active life force vibration. Just knowing when the breath is coming in. And knowing when the breath is going out. We know it by feeling it. We feel it because of awareness. With the relaxed present moment awareness. Centered in the body. Natural connection to the life force vibration. Just notice the four phases of each breath cycle the expanding in breath with a brief pause. Contracting out breath in the brief pause. In the moment of birth, the moment of death, it's natural life force. Vibration of metta. Keeping this body alive. Whether you're good or whether you're bad, it doesn't care. Keeps on breathing. While you're feeling the breathing process, you notice other sensations in the body, the sensations of the clothing rubbing against the skin, maybe subtle pulsations of blood, 
the fingers, the prickling sensation, even aches of pain. They're all just life force vibrations. So breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting, breath by breath, moment by moment. At the same time, be alert for thoughts sneaking up into the mind. Steal that life force attention away from you. Present moment life force to draw it into the past and or future thinking. Any of the hindered feelings. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, living, breathing bodies, the natural connection to the present moment awareness. We lose that natural connection to the present moment awareness, the breathing body, and the mind gets easily carried away to the past, future thoughts, of liking, disliking, worry, fear, anxiety, greed, and hatred. It's cultivating that natural rebound effect to re back, re rebound back to the breathing body. It takes some more deep, slow breaths to help maintain that connection to the breathing body in the present moment, life force awareness. Try to feel more and more subtle sensations coming in and going in the breathing body. The 
those life force vibrations going on in the body is the metta, the universal metta. And how are we going to be actively cultivating again these thought vibrations of metta, the Brahma Viharas? First of all, start with forgiving anybody your mind still might be holding on to and perceived wrong. So just try to remember some person from the past or present that you may still be holding some ill feelings towards. Just try to remember, put that person in front of your mind. Try to really see their face. Just understand this person also as a living being that has their own problems. Yes, they might have done something to hurt you, but they did that out of their own ignorance and conditioning. Being disconnected from their own truth. Just try to remember the circumstances of whatever that situation was, if it was an argument or something else. Just know maybe remember that person might have done a lot of other good things, they might be friendly to other people. But for whatever reason, there's some karmic attachment, some karmic lessons to be learned. You really just try to look into their face and just tell them I forgive you for what you've done, for what I think you've done. I know you're better than that. Even if it kind of hurts, just try to bring that up. I forgive you. Holding on to these memories is a poison for our own mind. I forgive you.
Now put yourself in front of your own mind. Try to understand your own role in that particular situation. A lot of times we think we're completely innocent, but that there could be some deeper underlying reasons why the situation happened. Just forgive yourself for any potential causes that might have contributed to that situation. When it, I did that out of unmindfulness. Understanding the pain that comes from our own mindfulness. And making the determination not to, to be more mindful in the future. And knowing now that you're actively practicing meditation, trying to change your mind, turn a new leaf, give up those old types of thoughts and habits. Now, Again, do some deep, slow breathing. Take a deep, slow breath, hold the air in your lungs several seconds. Right, imagine or feel that oxygenated blood in the lungs going into the bloodstream, carrying that oxygenated blood out to all the cells of the body, tranquilizing their excitement. And feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath, feeling the last bit of air go out of the lung. Let's try to take several more deep, slow breaths like that. And deep breathing again is the metta. Sending metta to your own body and mind. Feel that relaxation on the out breath. And take a few more deep, slow breaths, sending those metta thoughts to that person. So breathing in, holding in the breath, imagine subtle life force vibrations going to them, the mental vibrations, thinking, may you be well, peaceful, and happy. And be free from greed, hatred, attachments, aversions, ego-centeredness. May you be well, happy, and peaceful. May you be free from fear, anxiety, guilt, worry, remorse.
Now, if you can, just continue to do some deep, slow breathing. If you get tired of the deep, slow breathing, just be aware of the, the normal short-term breaths, cultivating these, extending these thoughts of metta outward. Again, thinking of your family members, and my parents, other family members, relatives. May all of them be well, happy, and peaceful. Free from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance. Be free from worry, anxiety. May they have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May they also have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May they have the opportunity to hear the teachings of the Dhamma and to learn and practice meditation to help free the mind from confusion and suffering. May they be well, peaceful, and wise. If you have any particular persons in your family or relatives who need extra metta, you can send that specifically to them. Now sending these metta vibrations further outward. Just try to recollect all the people that you currently work with or see every day, or people that in the various shops that you visit in, and others, people collecting your trash and recyclables, common ordinary folks that are struggling to make ends meet in this difficult world, desiring happiness but encountering all kinds of difficulties and problems. May all of them be well, happy, and peaceful free from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance, free from the pains and sorrows of body and mind brought about by their unskillful, unmindful thought, speech, and actions, or from the karmic interactions with others. May they have the patience, strength, mindfulness and wisdom 
meet and overcome all difficulties in life. If they haven't already, may they also have the opportunity to hear the teachings of the Dhamma and to learn and practice meditation. We hope free the mind from confusion and suffering. May they be well, peaceful, and wise. Now extending these thoughts of metta further outward. And just think about all the famous, powerful people in the world, the politicians, rulers of countries, people that control the various corporations that affect the lives of so many people, or other movie stars and famous people that influence others for good or for worse. And just sending these in, in the same thoughts, may they be well, happy, and peaceful free from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance, free from pains and sufferings of body and mind brought about by their unskillful, unmindful thought, speech, and action. And they also have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to make the right decisions in life that affect so many other millions of people. May they also have the opportunity to hear the teachings of the Dhamma, to learn and practice meditation, to help free the minds from confusion, and suffering. May they be well, peaceful, and wise. Now begin some deep, slow breathing again, holding in the breath a few seconds, and slowly breathing out. Again, start to imagine the life force of awareness and activated life force going outwards across the fields, countryside, to the town, cities. With each out breath, imagine those waves of metta permeating further and further outwards, spreading out across the whole state, the whole country, and eventually out across the whole earth. Just 
release each out breath, just imagine these waves or with each heartbeat. Imagine these waves of pure metta going outwards with the thoughts that may all living beings, wherever they might be, visible or invisible, living near or far away, the rich or the poor, strong or the weak, famous or the obscure, including not only human beings, but also the animal world, the beings in the other world. May all beings have the patience and strength, and mindfulness and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings be able to hear the mind healing teachings of the Dhamma to learn and practice meditation to help free their minds from confusion and suffering. May they be well, peaceful, and wise. Now, if you can imagine it, just try to imagine the beautiful blue green earth that's suspended in space is from the NASA photograph. And with each out breath, just imagine these waves of metta vibrations surrounding the whole earth, permeating the atmosphere, down to the ground level, beneath the ground level. These warm, healing vibrations. Pure energy, pure love, pure wisdom. It's tranquilizing all the negativity, negative vibrations. Even sending these stock vibrations even beyond the earth. into the outer solar system and beyond, it's permeating the whole, all the 10 directions of space, so with each heartbeat and with each out and breath, I genuinely feel these vibrations of pure love, pure wisdom, pure energy, the healing vibrations. The idea that may all living beings be well, peaceful, and why? May all beings be well, peaceful, and why? Just like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and wise.
meditation, I invite you to join in if you can remember that chant we did this morning. You know, I call the metta chant, although there are different metta chants, but this one's a you know, simple one, easy to remember. Dukkha pata chani dukkha Bhaya pata chani bhaya Sokha pata chani sokha Sabi Pipanino May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way, may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom, which automatically means metta. Wisdom and metta are synonymous. And thus spoke the Buddha. Now mindfully place your hands at the edge of your knees. And take another deep, slow breath. And as you breathe in, stretch your head back and pull the hands against your knees. Try to arch the spine backward. And lift the head up on an out breath. Press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertically. And lift the chin up level on an in breath. And relax on the out breath. Still try to keep your attention nice and connected with the body, just feeling the body, feeling the state of your mind. And now we'll uh, try to look at uh, some of those questions from the chat box that we uh, didn't get to before. And if any of you have any further uh, questions or comments about the practice, uh, you can be writing them down in the chat box. Uh, okay, this one question. Uh, what about when someone is not ready or fearful of present moment life energy and reacts to you? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that is a problem, uh, but a problem to be mitigated. Of course, most people have been disconnected from the life force. It's important to understand when the baby was born, or for nine months in the womb, 
all the mind could feel was the tremendous life force energy of the cells dividing, going from a one cell organism from the moment of conception to a multi-billion cell organism in nine months. I mean, that's a lot of energy going on there, especially when that energy is creating one of the most wonderful and complex organisms that we know of so far, uh, you know, in the world. And so the mind was directly connected to that. The mind was, that's all that news was that tremendous life force in a state of present moment awareness. When, when, when the baby comes out of the womb, what happens? And little by little, it starts focusing outward and uh, then it starts learning language and the parents give it a name and relatives come over and start holding it and going Gucci Gucci goo. And, you know, you know, the young baby has oceanic awareness when it's born. That means it doesn't even know the difference between its body, its mother's body. It's basically kind of a blank slate on the conscious level. But then the relatives come over and start giving it things, paying it attention. And what used to be a very expanded oceanic awareness starts to coagulate and condense and sort of form behind the eyeball, so to speak, into this sense of, oh, there's an eye here. And then a bound, that first boundary of the skin, everything beneath the skin is me, belongs to Joe or Susie, and everything outside of the skin is the other. And there immediately becomes this uh, confrontation between the I and other. That's artificially created. And we become disconnected and then you start thinking of the past and the future. Or the sweet grandmother comes over and gives the baby its first sweet. And then the baby tastes that sweet chocolate. And then it has a pleasant sensation, gives the baby a pleasant sensation. And then it starts to uh, identify the face of the grandmother with the pleasant sensation. And then it starts hoping the grandmother will come again or that face will come again because it's hoping for a pleasant sensation. And then maybe the grandfather or the uncle squeeze the baby too tight and gives a painful feeling. And the baby will identify that face as something that gets a, a painful feeling and doesn't want it to come again in the future. And that is the birth of the past and the future. It remembers sensations from the, the past and then projects them into the future, either with desire for more pleasurable feelings or aversion to the painful feelings. And the more you project out into the future, the further you get away from your truth, the further you get away from the present moment. That means your breathing body. And so by the time the child is, you know, three, four, five, six years old, it's lost that natural connection to the present moment. And it's thinking in terms of the past or future. Oh, Christmas, what am I gonna get for Christmas? Who's gonna give me this for, or that for Christmas or my birthday or so many other things. I mean, all these cultural uh, things, I mean, I'm not criticizing that necessarily, but you know, it's this idea of, we start developing this desire for the past or the fear of the future or uh, what's going to happen uh, in the future, all identified around this life. So that is how we get fearful and we become identified with the ego, the I. And most people know nothing, you know, other than that, really, by the time they, you get older. So uh, they're disconnected from that life energy. And so it, when you start to get into that in meditation, people sometimes get the fear. 
I mean, many people in the meditation, they, they've told me, and even myself in the, in the first uh, sometimes when I was meditating, when you, the mind starts quieting down and the thoughts of the past or future kind of subside, and you feel that that present moment is sort of like a void because the past and the future disappears. And that's all we know. That's all the ego knows. And when you give up that clinging to the past or the future, the sense of I starts vanishing because the sense of I is just a, a thought within the mind that we go on creating moment by moment. So, uh, you know, when people uh, get to that point in meditation, a lot of times they, they panic, even though they want to go fully into the silence. When they reach that edge where it feels like the past and the future are going to be pulled out from underneath them or the sense of I is going to be pulled, they panic. And uh, they get pulled back into their thoughts. So, you know, and, and start thinking, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's right. You know, this meditation will drive me mad and all these things. So it blocks them. So they're afraid of that, uh, of entering into that life energy. So anyway, what about it when somebody's not ready? Most people are not ready. Now, all of you that are interested in meditation, of course, and people around the world, they're getting more and more interested in the meditation. But a lot of it is just for some medical reasons, you know, just to... Uh, lose their anxiety or overcome their anger or lower their blood pressure or a number of uh, known medical benefits to meditation and that's well and good. But uh, a lot of people don't are not ready for going uh, deeper into that. Or even if they think they're ready, once they do it, they encounter these hindrances that are coming up to, to prevent us reaching those deeper. Uh, levels. So anyway, when people react to us, we have to mean that's a time to be equanimous and to have compassion. So if somebody starts attacking you, what are you a Buddhist for? Who is the Buddha? You know, is he better than Jesus or somebody else? Or, you know, people will say all kinds of weird things. Uh, or they say meditation drives you mad, meditation from the devil or whatever. So we have to just check our thoughts and don't engage them really because it's almost very difficult to talk to people when they're that fixed to their views. So in the moment when it's happening, uh, you know, you could tell people, well, that's your belief, uh, it's okay, but it's, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, a lot of people are not ready to, you know, hear about they don't want to look into themselves because what they will see, sometimes they won't like the looks of it. That means their own greed and ego and so on. But that's the work we're doing. You know, you can't uh, get away from it. And uh, once you get a taste of that, that present moment awareness, it's just underneath the skin, really. Uh, it's like a whole other world uh, arises. It's a, it's a separate reality. It's a parallel dimension of the now. Uh, and so we react with just having compassion for them and developing an equanimity, being aware of what their thoughts are creating within you. You can feel heat or other reactions and just internally tell yourself to relax, relax. And uh, not to let it uh, get to you. So th th these are the, you know, you're gonna encounter these kind of situations all the time out there in the world because most people's lives are, are driven with, you know, are so busy or they're so full of problems that it consumes their mind and uh, they're, they're just reactions. Most people just react. So uh, that's really where we practice the Dhamma. And that's why we need to do these uh, minute meditations because you never know when some kind of situation is going to arise in your daily life. You're in the supermarket, and, you know, somebody bumps into you and knocks your groceries uh, and down, or somebody else's undisciplined child comes over and, you know, uh, says something, or, 
you know, and so we have to have our mindfulness always primed and ready not to react and just pause and understand, okay, these are just conditioned. Uh, these people are just doing things out of conditioning and, and uh, you know, not to react to them and be try to be kind and uh, have that bring up that metta and compassion. Uh, and even mudita. So let's say a person, you know, you're standing in line at the checkout counter and somebody cuts in the line in front of you. Yeah, cultivate mudita. Yeah, go ahead. Well, good fortune, you couldn't go earlier. Maybe you got a problem at home, you have to get home. Instead of getting angry at them or something else, let somebody else scold them if they like, but you yourself can uh, just maintain calm and and not to, at least not to get upset and you know shout at them or something like that. So a few extra minutes not going to kill most people. So these are way these are, this is practicing the Dhamma in very in very concrete active ways, and that's why we practice meditation so we can minimize the unnecessary suffering that we cause ourselves by reacting unmindfully in situations and getting caught up in other people's karma and uh, so on. Uh, so that's just uh, one aspect about that. I mean, I had a lot of situations, you know, being dressed in robes in America, you know, has, <laughs> has brought a lot of uh, opportunity for <laughs> catcalling and other snide remarks and even some outright, you know, threats and so on. But I've always relied on that metta, that mindfulness just to stop whenever something is happening like that and just sort of to use the cliche, vibe the person, you know, with, with metta and, uh, and uh, know that, let them burn off their steam, whatever it is, they're ranting and raving or, and, uh, you know, not to feed it by, trying to defend yourself or any other types of things. The best, best way is just keep quiet. Because if you don't react to them, most people will just, you know, leave. So anyway, those are uh, some of the, the ways that, you know, we have to use our skills in meditation and also the Brahma Viharas to get through this uh, world. Okay, let's... Um, See this next question. What about faking the acts of compassion or sympathetic joy, but not really feeling compassion in certain situations? Is this helpful in developing or just distracting and developing confusion? Look, in the beginning, we're not going to have these perfect emotions. And that's why we call it practice, right? The same way as when you meditate, you learn, you, you're trying to learn meditation. You're not gonna have perfect meditation every time or even near perfect or even, you know, most of your meditations would probably be uh, mediocre, right? So uh, it takes time to develop these good qualities. Actually, it takes time to wear out the old negative habits. Uh, the, and basically habits are just neuronal pathways within the, the brain and nervous system. Really what, what we are is just one gigantic interconnected set of electromagnetic vibrations. Ask any physicist, he'll tell you, yes, that's true. And uh, everything, all habits are because of the neural pathways we've developed in the brain since the time we were a baby. And they don't change overnight. They, they can change that. That's called neuroplasticity. The old school in science said we can't change the brain. But now they're learning that, yes, we can. And uh, through the conscious development. So that's what we're doing, uh, is consciously through being more mindful and aware of our intentions, we break that habit of reacting uh, habitually to the habit and replace those negative habits 
Like instead of thinking ill will towards somebody, you substitute it with thinking metta. Uh, or the thought of cruelty, uh, substitute with the thought of compassion, being kind to a person, and so on. So in the beginning, it might feel like it's a little bit, uh, you could call it fake, but uh, or at least contrived, but uh, it's the same way as when you start meditating also. When you first start meditating, you, you, you sit straight and kind of, you know, think or want to show somebody else or you're meditating, but your mind might be all kind of full of hindrances and ego uh, while you're doing that. That's not necessarily to say it's bad, but at least you will uh, get your legs adjusted and to, you know, sitting. And eventually the mind will come around if you continue. So don't be too concerned. Uh, whether, uh, you know, you uh, are not perfect in the development of uh, these emotions because it does uh, take a lot of time. But at least uh, trying to do it, even though it's not perfect or it's tainted by something, little by little, it will gradually uh, become a more uh, pure intention because it, again it all it all comes back to the sense of self the more there's the thought of i me or mine into any action or thought uh, that's going to be the the degree of that uh, of action how much ego is there and that's why you can't successfully practice metta karuna mudita as long as you're not working on the ego also. That's why the insight meditation and general meditation practice, especially the insight meditation, the Vipassana meditation, where we train ourselves to develop mindfulness, concentration, wisdom, cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness and the factors of enlightenment. All these are designed at seeing the the non-self nature of the five aggregates. Uh, I think we've probably all heard of the five aggregates. Actually, uh, Monday night, I'm going to be giving a talk on another Zoom program uh, on another uh, from, from some other uh, group uh, on the five aggregates. Uh, but uh, I don't immediately have that <laughs> a link to that one. But uh, anyway. Uh, but I've given talks on the five aggregates before. So uh, that's why you, you need to work on the, the insight meditation and developing mindfulness concentration, as well as the Brahma Viharas. They help to support each other. It's not like you just practice one and you don't practice the other. No, they're mutually inclusive. And so you can start uh, you can start your meditation period by, let's say, practicing metta or for, actually forgiving people uh, that might have hurt you during the day or any other negative feelings by letting them go. Uh, and then go into the main body of your meditation, developing mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of the body, uh, you know, and uh, general uh, mindfulness vipassana practice or if you're trying to attain the jhanic levels of concentration uh, doing that. But then when you come out also, when you at the end of meditation, uh, it's good to practice it again because, so at the beginning of meditation, you can send out the, the metta, hopefully to release the grosser types of any negative mind states to get relaxed and then go into your meditation uh, mindfulness of breathing, developing mindfulness, concentration. And then at the end, hopefully you would have gotten some insights or some deeper levels of calmness and some insights during the meditation that then you can then in the meditation with uh, some radiation of metta also uh, based on that wisdom that you got in the meditation 
some deeper understanding, then that, that's how your metta naturally comes out. It's, it's based on the wisdom. It's not some intellectual exercise. It's based on the wisdom. And knows how everybody is karmically interconnected. And we're all caught in greed, hatred, and delusion. And once you, you see that in your own mind, that, and you know that everybody is caught in the same thing, you know, and we've all contributed to everybody else's greed, hatred, and delusion in one way or another. So these are the ways that we have to develop, also reflect on, you know, reflect on them. And knowing that the process is not, is not going to be easy for most people. And it will take a long time. And as I said, it's the practice is, is like a child learning how to walk. You know, you, you take the child who stands up on wobbly knees, takes a step or two, falls down, and he's got to get back up. And he keeps on doing that hundreds and thousands of times until the muscles uh, get uh, strong enough. And our meditating in daily, our daily meditation, like you sit in, let's say, meditate in the morning and evening, uh, that's just like training wheels or, you know, a young child uh, gets a bike and they put training wheels on the, the back wheels, two extra wheels. And uh, he learns to ride with his training wheels in order to, until he gets a balance. And then little by little, they take those wheels off and then he can ride, you know, uh, without the wheels. And eventually he can even go out and do the street and maneuver around. And so that's the same way with our practice of Dhamma. Uh, we might limit it for a while, uh, you know, uh, practicing, uh, but uh, then as you grow into it, then you're able to use these things out in your everyday uh, life in a more effective way. Uh, and so you, you know, the Dhamma becomes a, a living thing rather than something you just practice. It becomes, you know, your whole sort of consciousness has to gradually change. Okay, let's see. I'm new to the practice and unguided meditations are very difficult. The monkey mind is very strong. Are mala beads used in your practice? If so, is that something you suggest may help? If they are, is there anything you can suggest would help? <laughs> well, people count mala beads, right? Well, count your breaths. So I would suggest, you know, uh, for people learning to meditate, that counting your breaths from one to 10 is a very, one of the best practices. Because we all, you know, think we can count, right? And uh, the breath is something that's right there inside of you. And so you train yourself to count as I was doing once or twice with you today. And if you get lost, if you're counting two or three and you find yourself lost in thoughts, you recognize that you're lost and then you come back to start at one again. Now, I didn't do that with you today. I simply counted from one to 10. And because I was continually uh, counting, maybe your mind was able to follow that. But when you try to do it on your own at home, you, you see how easily the mind will get lost. And so it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a challenge. Uh, did you have to start again at one every time the mind gets lost? You have to start again counting at one. So, you know, you, you don't want to feel like a fool, have a noise, you can't even count to three without the mind getting lost, right? So it helps you to be more mindful and alert for when thoughts are coming. So once you can, you know, count up to 10 without getting lost, that's what I call uh, stage one uh, concentration. Uh, and then you could either repeat it again, or you can count from 10 and go back to one. When you reverse the count, you have to be doubly mindful to remember where you were counting. So, uh, 
you know, if you can count from one to 10 and from 10 back to one without getting lost, then I would say that would be like counting the mala beads. And, uh, and then you can uh, go into uh, just silent non-count, you know, mindfulness of breathing without, without counting. But I would say until you can count from one to 10, don't bother trying to do much other meditation. If you can't do that, I don't think you're going to be successful in doing any other kind of meditation. Either. Sorry to say that. <laughs> I know people are different and maybe some people are weird, but uh, these other things, counting malas, that's actually for counting mantras, actually. The mala was originated for counting mantras in Tibetan practice or in Hindu chanting and so on, just to remember, because they're supposed to, to do 108 repetitions of mantras, so they use the mala to make sure you'll find out when they count it to 108. Uh, but you can use some uh, short mantras, like in Thailand, the uh, forest teachers have people just say buddho. So you're breathing in and you just repeat the word buddho, I mean, silently in your mind. When you're breathing out, you can also say buddho. Buddho means awareness. So it means the 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 buddhic awareness, the, the natural awareness, Buddha, the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha simply was the name they call the person the Buddha because his mind was awake, awake to the present moment. So you, you can use that as a mantra, Buddha, Buddha, counting. It's like the, it's a, just a substitute for counting the breath. And if that helps you to concentrate, well and good. Uh, sometimes I even, uh, begin meditation periods with chanting Namo Buddhaya. Uh, and the mantras are, are okay if you don't get too attached to them. But the, like a man, Namo Buddhaya means homage to the Buddha. But in this case, it means homage to the natural wisdom of present moment awareness that we have inside, literally just beneath our nose. Uh, this vibration of present moment awareness. So anyway, so, you know, I would suggest rather than, uh, you know, a mala developing this uh, the counting of the breaths and or uh, reciting a simple little word like buddho with the in-breath, buddho with the out-breath, until it goes by itself, until you reach the concentration. So that's called applied and sustained thought. Is uh, the factors of jhana when the mind has uh, uh, developed that continuous uh, attention to the the object. <clears throat> but you know, there's plenty of guided meditation. That's why we give these guided meditations. They've all been recorded, and use the guided meditations. I would say, you know for a couple of times until you kind of learn the method. You've got, to, you've got to give yourself a guided meditation. So you have to know how the process works. So every time you sit down, you have to talk yourself through it. Okay, sit down, keep the back straight, keep the chin up, you know, relax the body, you know, focus the attention, take a few deep, slow breaths. And in doing those deep, slow breaths, you can count the breaths at the same time, uh, too. So you also get the effect of doing the deep, slow breathing. And it's easier to count the breaths when they're longer and deeper like that. And then by the time you've done uh, 10 deep, slow breaths, the mind and body probably would have gotten quite relaxed. And then you can let go of it. Or you could continue uh, it for a little bit longer. Or you can come back to it during the meditation. If your mind has too many thoughts come again or you get tired or sleepy, you come back and take some deep, slow breathing. You know, holding the air in the lungs two or three seconds to feel that subtle energy of the oxygen going out into the bloodstream. You can actually feel that if you are, you know, quite focused. Uh, so anyway, those are just some suggestions that I would uh, suggest. Oh, right. next question is here. 
There were a few spiders in my home during the summer. We have a lot of spiders in our house. Spiders are good, actually. Uh, my kids asked me to kill them. I tried to teach them compassion. They told me to choose between them and bugs. And of course, they're, they're not meaning that. They're just, you know, that's how child children talk, you know. Uh, I had to spray insecticide. Uh, you know, and with other bugs. You, you don't have to spray that. I, you clean the cobwebs, you know, you know the spiders. Make it, make it fun for them to, you know, get one of these cobweb cleaners and tell them, you know, go and clean the cobwebs. And the spider might go and make a new one. But tell them the spiders are good. They're going to eat the, eat the other bugs, you know, and, uh, and so on. But I know it, it is difficult with, <laughs> with children especially. But a lot of children, you know, they'll respect life, you know. Tell them a spider has a, wants to live, you know, like you. And all these other insects, they're just trying, you know, they have a right to live like anybody else. Look at human beings, they go around plotting traps for people and, and killing people. So why do you get angry, you know, at a, a bug that does that? That's their karma. It's not the karma for a human being to be going around and unnecessarily killing and harming and maiming uh, other living life because they should know better than that. They have a developed mind. Insects don't have that. So, uh, you know, you have to teach them to respect the life and say, well, you don't have to kill the, the bugs. You'll feel better if you don't kill them. You clean the cobwebs, maybe they'll go somewhere else. And the same with mice. You know, don't put out poison for mice, get a cat. <laughs> That's what we did here at the, at the meditation center. <laughs> we had a big mouse problem last uh, winter and people wanted to put traps and then uh, get a cat. Once a cat came, we never saw another mouse. And he didn't catch any mice. They just ran away. So uh, we'll see what happens this winter. So anyway, I know it's difficult when the Dharma comes into contact, conflict with reality around us, whether it's insects and animals trying to, you know, just do their thing and, and you know, eat through our electric wires or chew our wooden buildings. And, or other people, you know, doing things. It's a constant uh, survival. And the Dhamma is our only way of remaining sane in that, in that conflict, you know, and without creating the conditions that are gonna, you know, keep our mind caught in that cycle. Okay. Okay, that looks like that's the uh, end of those questions. Now, does anybody have any? Uh, does anybody who has any last uh, questions uh, feel free to, you know, unmute your uh, mic and uh, ask a question. Monty, I have a question. Yes. So as we deepen our meta practice, we start with uh, verbal, with cognitive. But a necessary part of the process is going to be a growing emotional state, a meta emotional state that is really, and I'm thinking, I'm theorizing here, like I can imagine that being very um, um, uh, transforming for the mind when this meta state develops that's kind and open and giving and warm and loving, you know what I'm saying? I'm thinking that it, it helps to change the mind in the direction of the Dhamma. I wouldn't um, call that emotion. Can you speak you know, to that? Meta is yeah. a, higher, a higher emotion. Emotion is, emotion is usually a reaction to something, whereas meta is a natural vibration of the, the the purified mind or the mind that's not dominated so much by 
the ego and by reactive uh, reactions and so on. So is it something higher emotion? When we took our break today, I kind of I laid down and I sort of thought, tried to think back and like I thought, well, maybe um, I'll kind of do like um, uh, uh, Buddha did under the tree, where he thought back and he remembered when he was, you know, a child and et cetera, and he had that state. Can we do that with meta? Can we think to situations where we've had this internal experience as we've opened and given to others, and we've had that internal experience, and we can try to recollect it? Or is again that going like towards more emotion and not what we're really talking about with Meta? Think about your mother. Your mother, the child acts up. You know, most mothers wouldn't smack their child or, or something. They have that very loving attitude toward them uh, because of that natural love that a mother would have for their, uh, their child. Uh, and even if the child is very naughty, right? And uh, even for myself, you know, I, I left uh, home at a young age and went around the world and became a Buddhist monk. And oh my God, they thought that was the end of the world, you know. And, and uh, they were, you know, you know, but uh, they still accepted me, you know, and uh, so on. But anyway, I'm, uh, so uh, yeah, we can. Uh, think back there's many instances of that uh, the mother of course has love for her own child but they will have because of that motherly instinct they, they'll have that uh, feeling for a lot of other children uh, too and uh, so that's an, a natural thing that uh, comes out more or less in the, you know like a mother so you can think about that thank you or other instances, uh, you know, when you were a child, when, you know, before you developed a, a lot of anger or hatred and so on. How peaceful, even how peaceful you, you get a nice a peaceful meditation, then you have to ask yourself, hmm. okay, look, at like, you know, I got this five or 10 minutes of deep peaceful meditation. And, How'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Well, it comes from inside of you. It's there all the time. And it's simply we have difficulty accessing it because of all the, the conditioned emotions and reactions to so many things that are going on around us, you know, and the hindrances. So to, to, to keep reinforcing and remembering that, yes, just like the Buddha, remembered when he was a young child at two years old, he re remembered doing Anapanasati. And so when he was already 35 years old, he said, okay, let me, let me go back and just practice Anapanasati. You know, he remembered that. And that's how he that led him to his enlightenment. Thank you. So it's good to reflect actually on the things that have made you peaceful or brought you some real joy or happiness. And how did that come about? And then reflect on the things that brought you misery or unhappiness. And how did that come about? And uh, you know, that's all the way the Buddha also in his meditations you reflect, you divide your thoughts and the thoughts that are wholesome and thoughts that are unwholesome. And you learn how to uh, uh, discriminate between an unwholesome thought and a wholesome thought. So you don't tolerate a thought of, of anger or ill will or some other jealousy or some other negative thought. You just don't to tolerate it and say, oh, mindful, 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 it'll go away. Yeah, well, lots of love. And uh, instead you replace it. You cultivate the right effort to substitute negative thoughts for wholesome uh, thoughts in the beginning. And sometimes we have to make an effort for that because isn't, we're not trained. But once we're able to develop that reflexive uh, uh, ability to uh, let go of negative thoughts and cultivate the wholesome uh, ones, uh, then it becomes uh, much easier to, uh, you know, becomes more automatic.
Ante, I have a question. How does physical heart and brain play a role to cultivate metta? The heart and brain? Physical heart and brain. Is there any role of that or is it this is all on the Nam Rupa, like it's all on the mental side itself? This is all the... Or... Well, there is, uh, you know, some teachers uh, or even in the Abhidhamma, they somehow connect the, the heart to uh, the wisdom or pure awareness and so on. But uh, in the suttas, we don't really find much to talk about that. We talk only about the, the Buddha talked about the mind and the mental activities and the consciousness, the pure consciousness. And whether that consciousness arises in the heart or arises in the brain, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say where it uh, arises. It arises where it arises. And uh, uh, the heart is normally associated with love, of course. Uh, but uh, that is, I don't know, that could be a lot of cultural conditioning and, and so on. Uh, because, you know, a person could have a heart transplant and, uh, you know, then where would their mind go? They're gonna, their old mind has to now go into a new heart and to be conscious and so on. So there's a lot of questions around that, but, uh, you know, the mind is the predominant generator. I mean, mano pubanga madhamma is what the, the Buddha, uh, you know, in the Dhammapada verse, mind is the forerunner of all conditions, um, and so on. So, you know, it's not easy to understand. There's very, very deep uh, levels of, you know, where exactly are thoughts of consciousness is arising from, whether it's the heart or brain or somewhere else. But the fact is we can observe it. We can be aware of our thoughts. And we can also be aware of stilling uh, the thoughts. And when you gain that uh, tranquility and feel that vibration of present moment life force, you don't have to say, is it my brain? Is it my body is my nervous system is my heart and my toe and those are irrelevant it is what it is so that avoids getting uh, pulled into arguments with people who are arguing about whether consciousness arises in your heart or brain or other uh, ideas about it thank you Bhante. And there's one more question. Sure. Where? In the chat? Yes, Mante. Uh, are body and mind the same? Is this not one of the questions the Buddha did not answer? Uh, well, let's say, you know, there's all, there's two levels of truth, right? We have relative truth, which is the normal knowledge of the conditioned mind. So he says, yes, there, there is a, you know, difference in sexes. There's a man and there's a woman. And there's a difference in, uh, you know, all the differences uh, that we see, there is this physical body uh, and th there is the mind. But uh, the idea of a body is largely created in the mind. So in that way, you could say that uh, the mind has created this body, of course. It's through our past karma. And when we die, our mind is attracted to a plane of birth according to one's karma, whether you're gonna get another human body or you're gonna get an animal body or you're gonna get the body of a deva or uh, you know, some other kind of body. So 
even the type of body we're going to get has its roots or seeds in the, in the mind. So that's one way that we can uh, reflect on uh, that. That they're different, but uh, they're altogether not different. And that's why the Buddha and all these questions were asked to him. He said, it's not the same, not different, not both, not neither. Uh, so <laughs> in that way, he, he didn't you know, uh, want to uh, get somebody to cling to some kind of idea, uh, any particular kind of idea. And we, but, you know, we can detach the mind to some extent to the body. And of course, people who've had near death experiences, they, they uh, you know, at the that time, the mind does separate from the body and exists without this physical body, but it creates a mental body for itself. Uh, but this physical body we all know is going to uh, disintegrate at the time of, of death. Uh, but the mind needs a, a, a mental body, will create a mental body until it, at what time it finally gets another physical uh, body. Okay, uh, that's the end of Vista's questions. And, uh, so, <clears throat> but I, I just wanted to mention, you know, in the, uh, in generally in our practice of the Dhamma, that, you know, people are always asking, you know, how can we integrate and practice the Dhamma in the midst of daily life, because of all the challenges and, and so on that are you know going in, and especially you know in the last uh, two years it was uh, very difficult for so many people in, in terms of trying to balance all the other aspects of their life, family life, work, uh, social life has been a lot of upheaval, and uh, but just. Uh, in our normal life in general. Uh, usually, the people, uh, the teachers will advise you to meditate, try to meditate twice a day. And the reason for that is, is the mind is like a, a muscle, you might say, the ability to concentrate, the ability to be mindful. It's like, you know, a, a muscle. If you don't flex the muscles, or exercising, they're going to get weak. And uh, so the same way, the more we practice, the stronger our mindfulness and concentration becomes. And the wisdom arises out of our mindfulness and concentration. And so the more we practice also uh, the Brahma Viharas, or especially Metta and Compassion, uh, even if it's contrived in the beginning, uh, gradually you will uh, begin to uh, appreciate and appreciate the effects of it. You would have to force yourself to do a good deed every day, you know, like the Boy Scout motto is to do a good deed every day. So try to help somebody every day. Or as I mentioned, if you see some insect uh, flopping about, uh, you know, instead of flushing it down the toilet or stomping on it or, uh, you know, letting your cat go or beat it around, you know, try, you know, just exercise some compassion and uh, do something good, you know, feel good about it. But anyway, the, the meditation, so the practice in, in the morning and evening, the practice meditation, I would say a minimum of 30 minutes probably it would be a minimum or maybe 20 minutes, but not less than that. And whether you, again, you practice, uh, you can start with practicing metta for a few minutes. You can practice mindfulness of breathing or general mindfulness, mindfulness of the body. You practice a little metta at the end or just, you know, practice one session of metta longer, alternate, but do some practice in the morning and evening. Uh, 
because if you only meditate once a day, that's 24 hours until you uh, meditate again. And the mind tends to forget very easily. And that's not enough to kind of combat all the other unmindful pressures and stress that we're going to be having uh, in our daily life. So especially in the morning is a good time to prepare your mind for the day ahead. So a few, uh, you know, some metta at the beginning or at the end of the meditation and then the, the main body of your meditation by trying to just develop your concentration, develop your mindfulness, try to be, you know, to practice that they get grounded in the, in the body and in the present moment. Uh, so that that will help stay with you during the day. But it usually would fade away after some time. But then in the evening is a good time to uh, practice the, the metta and to forgiveness. So anything that happened to you during the day whether it's in your family, you got to be upset with your child or somebody at work or somebody, you know, cut you off in the traffic and you got upset. You know, you got to release uh, these things, not to let them accumulate. So in the evening, you can practice uh, forgiveness and then sending out the metta. And then uh, again, some calming meditation or just do a long metta meditation and go to sleep. Like you, you're, you're apt to... Uh, sleep a lot better with practicing the metta, calming your mind before sleeping to release any tension that was created during the day. Now, even if you do, as I've already mentioned, you meditate twice a day, in between you have 10 or 12 hours where we may not be very mindful because we get caught up and we don't have that practice of it of stopping regularly. So we get caught up in our uh, moods and reactions. And so that's where the M&Ms uh, are important, the meditation supplement. And just as an M&M candy is something small and sweet, so these one minute meditations are also short and sweet. And so it's a specific training. And they make apps nowadays that you can get an app and it'll beep, uh, you know, every hour, uh, you know, a little beep or, you know, a quacking sound and remind you, oh, yeah, stop what you're doing. So every hour, you, you train yourself to stop whatever you're doing, even if you're, st best time to do it is when you're standing, having just finished something and before rushing to do something else, pause. And just take a deep, slow breath. Hold in the breath for several seconds. Bring your attention to the body. Try to feel those sensations of holding the breath in for a few seconds of oxygen going into the bloodstream and out to the cells, or even just imagine that. And then feel the relaxation on the out breath. And you take two or three breaths like that, and it's already one minute. But mainly what you're doing is you're breaking that neurotic push into the future and learning how to pause and recognize the world will wait for you. You tend to think, oh, the world's not going to wait. I got so many things. It'll wait because we wind up wasting a lot of time during the day cleaning up our messes from when we were unmindful. We're rushing somewhere and then we forgot, oh, I forgot that oh, because we were unmindful. So you learn how to and that's why mindfulness of the body is actually uh, one of the uh, better overall types of meditation because we have the body with us all the time. Our mind is out to lunch quite a lot, but our body is always there with us. And it's not difficult to feel it really if you just pause and remember, oh, what am I doing now? I'm standing, standing, or I'm sitting, sitting, or my hand is lifting up. My hand is opening, the head is turning to the right, turning to the left. So you learn how to be mindful of the body, even just practicing it for a minute uh, from time to time. But anyway, uh, you bring your mind to the present moment 
And then you can reflect on the last hour, again, to practice forgiveness, send out metta. Uh, and basically just to relax any tension that you accumulated in the previous hour so that you don't carry it over into the next hour. But that's what so many people do, isn't it? They, they go on collecting these little bits of stress from the early morning you know, to the evening. And uh, they don't know how to, uh, you know, without really letting go of it. And let's say you get up late, your alarm clock didn't go off and you get up late, you go, oh my gosh, oh, you, know, you hurry to jump off the bed and then you, you, you know, run to the bathroom and trip over something that was left on the floor uh, the night before. And maybe, you know, injure your hand and you get upset about that and you go into the bathroom and somebody, some other family member, somebody used the last of the shampoo and you get upset about that. And you go down to the, get your breakfast and somebody drank the last bit of milk. And, then, uh, uh, and so on, you, you go out to start your car, your car doesn't start, you get to work, the computers, internet's down. So, and so we go on accumulating all these stresses and they build up. So at the end of the day, people are a nervous wreck. And they take it home and take it out on their, their animals or their, their spouse or, or their children by being cranky or something. So the M&Ms are a way to help release that accumulation of stress hour by hour. So by the end of the day, hopefully we're not in that kind of a stressed out uh, situation. So that's the, what everybody is saying these days. Oh, so much stress, so much stress, so much stress. It's because you haven't released the stress. And, uh, but you have to release it shortly after it's accumulated. Otherwise, it's, it's harder to release. So that's why the M&Ms are so important during the day. Uh, and it's really uh, one of the best uh, ways of practicing the Dhamma during the day. Because anybody can stop for one minute. And apart from one minute, even you know, we have five or 10 or 15 seconds here or there of some downtime where we're just waiting around for something to happen. We let our minds just get caught up in uh, some unnecessary thoughts. Uh, or um, so we can learn how to just feel the body. Like you're waiting in line at the checkout counter in the supermarket instead of, you know, criticizing that person's hairdo or this person's shoes they're wearing or how this woman is controlling their kids or something like that. You can just feel your feet pressing the ground. Take a few deep breaths. Just be aware of breathing in, standing, breathing out, standing. Uh, or send out metta to the harried uh, you know, to the cashier who's fumbling with her jammed uh, tape machine. And uh, the other customers are, you know, getting impatient and, you know, send out a method to them rather than adding your two cents worth to it and so on. Or, you know, you're standing there and then your eyes get attracted to the all the magazine racks, you know, beside the checkout counter. And you, you see some headline that, you know, Michael Jackson was reborn. Oh, what's that? <laughs> Let your eyes get distracted. Man. So you just keep your eyes in your head and you can always just come to feel the feet pressing the floor, take a few deep breaths, send out metta, may all beings be well, happy and peaceful. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, delusion, like that, even in the space of 10 seconds. So like that, we have to learn how to take advantage of all of these little downtimes in between where we could practice uh, the Dhamma. And that's what I call practicing the Dhamma in a daily life. You know, our longer meditation sessions are good, of course, and they're necessary. But a lot of people think that's their Dharma practice, and then they forget about uh, you know, cultivating uh, this mindfulness during the day to keep that mindfulness up to snuff, so to speak. Okay, so that's what I want to, to share with you in, in this practice. 
And so as one, just as one uh, last uh, short little meditation, uh, we're just going to do another just very short uh, 10 minute meditation with some breathing. This is a very good uh, uh, method for, you know, starting your meditation practice and uh, combining the thoughts of metta with some activity. Because, you know, the mind always likes to think it's doing something, right? So if you just sit there not doing anything and, and then try to remember the words of metta, then, you know, it may be more difficult. So instead, you can, pardon the expression, kill two birds with one stone. You don't kill any birds, but anyway, you know. So you can combine deep, slow breathing with the thoughts of metta. So we already, I already kind of did that with you a little bit in the previous meditation, and we'll do it there again as just a short little meditation to refresh your mind. Okay, so just try to sit straight. Just relax the shoulders. Just feel the body grounded to the floor. Just feel your buttocks and feet pressing the floor. Just feel your hands touching together. Just feel the head balanced on top of the neck. Try to rest your awareness at that spot behind the eye, just feeling the eyes and the sockets. From that point behind the eyes, just let the awareness expand. Feel the outline of the sitting body. And then begin some of the deep, slow breathing again. Try to take at least three seconds to slowly expand the abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Bring the air all the way into the upper chest. Feel that expansion in the upper chest. Hold the air in a few seconds. Just imagine that oxygenated blood going out to the body and mind. And then feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. Try to feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs. And then the next incoming breath. And just try to take several more deep, slow breaths like that. And just imagine that was your metta to your own body. Just breathing in metta to the body is a deep breath, holding the breath in making the cells of the body happy with fresh life force, oxygen. And feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. And just cultivate these basic thoughts as you continue to take a few more deep, slow breaths. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. And breathing out, sitting here and now. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. And breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Repeating that to yourself a few more times with the breathing. With each in breath, feel those metaphysical meta vibrations, the oxygen, and the relaxing contractions of the out breath, making the minds more peaceful, much easier to concentrate when you're doing the deep, slow, regulated breathing. 
helps to calm the mind. At some point, if you get tired of the deep breathing, just let the deep breathing alone. Continue to just feel the body, just feel the breathing body. Especially to stay connected to the subtle vibration. You can feel those subtle life force vibrations, even just the pulse of blood or your heart beating. Just try to imagine that as the natural pure energy. It's beyond attachment or aversion. It's the pure life force vibration, which itself is a healing energy. You can stay in contact with the subtle life force vibrations that are always there. It keeps the mind connected to the present moment. Keeps you feeling that life force of natural metta karuna. And still pay attention to your breathing or the heartbeat, whichever you can feel the easiest. If you can feel the heartbeat easier than the breathing. You can feel that. And with each out breath, just imagine this life force energy in the body, those thoughts in the mind, those vibrations of the wisdom mind going outward, first filling up your own body and mind. These friendly, loving vibrations. And with each out breath or heartbeat, just imagine these waves of metta vibrations going outward to fill up your house, anybody else within your house and gradually extending that outwards as you did before just with each out breath or heartbeat just imagine these pure vibrations of life force which themselves are imbued with Pure love, pure wisdom, pure energy. Or if there are any animals you might have in your house, any other people, and going outwards to the neighbor across the countryside with each out breath and heartbeat, like that pulse. Just Imagine these waves of metta going further and further outward in all directions. Across the whole county, across the whole state. You can send some of those metta vibrations to anybody in particular that you might know that's suffering, needs that metta vibration. Keep imagining this metta vibrations going across the whole country, across the oceans, to all the continents, to surround the whole earth with loving, warm vibrations of friendliness, best wishes. to all the living beings. 
just with the idea that may all beings be well, happy, and peaceful, free from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance, free from pains and sufferings of body and mind brought about by unskillful karmic thought, speech, and action. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together, understanding the ultimate interconnectedness and oneness of that life force. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. Just like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and wise. I invite you to chant the word sadhu three times, slowly with the breathing. Chant the word sadhu, a long out breath. And take a deep, slow breath. Sadhu. Place the hands at the edge of the knees again. Take one more deep breath as you breathe in, stretch the head back, pull against the hands, you arch the spine a little bit. Lift the head up on an in breath and on the out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest. Stretch the neck for a little bit. Lift the chin up level on an in breath. And relax on the out breath. Put a smile on your face.
So friends, this brings our day of metta reflections to an end and I hope you're able to you know, maybe reflect or learn maybe a thing or two about how you can you know, use that, any of those things in your daily practice to cultivate both uh, metta as well as insights and to cultivate the other Brahma Viharas, uh, be aware of those other ones, whatever the situation uh, warrants it, especially with the mudita when you notice the mind having ill thoughts toward somebody else who seems to have something good happen to them. To, Okay, so I uh, thank you for participating and uh, wish you all the best. And don't forget, mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away. Bhante, thank you so much. We so much appreciate. It. And I just want to tell everybody, I put those links in for Donna in the uh, chat, and the first, the first PayPal's were the uh, graphic, not the link. So, but I put a corrected one in there. And of course, folks can always go to Lion of Wisdom. I just wanted to say I tried the second link and I got uh, I got the page that says thank you for your contribution. Yes, if it did it pull up the dollar amounts, you could put the money in there. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Uh, yeah. I, so I had to go. I think it's best to go on their website. I mean, that's already on their website and. Yeah, I was able to use the link because you just put, yeah. But either way, either through support on the website or the link there. Well, the link will be going away in a minute anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Monty, thank you. And uh, just, uh, you know, anybody there in Richmond, we have actually sometimes the people from Richmond coming down to our retreat center. And we have, uh, we're open even during this time uh, for people to come and spend a couple of days on self-retreat if they like or even longer. Uh, a week or even longer, perhaps, uh, on self-retreat. You can join our daily uh, morning and evening meditations and just have a, you know, a retreat from your home life or whatever. If you, you know, Richmond's uh, not that far, <laughs> kind of like. But anyway, just you can keep that in mind. If, if you need a little retreat, uh, we're, we're always here, okay? So... Uh, also on Wednesday nights, I do a suit to study program. Uh, those are on our website. You can find the links to the Wednesday night suit to study. As I mentioned, Monday night, I will be giving a Dhamma talk uh, uh, for a group uh, called the Blue Lotus Temple, I think. Uh, I forget where it is, but it's going to be a talk on the five aggregates and then a guided meditation for an hour on Monday night. Uh, probably starting at eight o'clock on EST, but uh, uh, if you're not on our mailing list, I may send that out on my mailing list tomorrow. Uh, but if you're not on it, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so all the best to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bonte.